Hello, everybody. Hello. Oh, that was so reluctant, but that's okay. It goes, I'm Al Filreis. I'm Al Filreis. I'm Simone White. And welcome to our third Kelly Writers House Fellows event and our third Kelly Rice Writers House Fellow of 2023. And we're going to thank Wayne Kestenbaum for being here, for coming to Philadelphia for these days with us for seminar, this three hour seminar session today, which was amazing and really wonderful. Three hours of Wayne. Couldn't it was get bliss. <laughs> it was a utopia. It was fantastic. Um, so Wayne is going to give a reading now. And um, after the reading, there'll be some time when you will be able to bring your Wayne books or purchase one of them. We're going to show what we have today. Um, the Writers House is strictly nonprofit. In fact, I think less than nonprofit. No, what do we, how do we say? Anyway, we're somewhat south of profit. Um, and we, so these books are available for exactly what we acquired them for, and we hope you will buy one or many. And Wayne is willing, we didn't talk about this, but I assume willing to stand here for a while, and you'll come up and Wayne, you can greet Wayne, and Wayne will inscribe your book. And in a minute, Sophia DeRose is gonna tell us about something else that Wayne can inscribe for you. So we do hope you'll stay. So do we want to show what they are? Yes, I sort of waved them at you before, but oh, this sorry. is, we have The Queen's Throat, which is- Gotta read that. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's subtitle is Opera, Homosexuality, and the Mystery of Desire, which is one of the books we read for fellows. It's amazing. I recommend it to everyone. This is Jackie Under My Skin, which you have all read, right? Uh, this is the amazing Andy Warhol biography. Also, I, I think this is maybe one of my favorite books. And figured out which is newer and newest, yes, newest from Wayne, um, a collection of essays and occasional pieces, maybe we could call it, um, all available for sale in the back. Tomorrow, Wayne and Simone and I will be here. We'll have a table set up and three microphones. And we're going to have an hour, maybe an hour and five minute interview conversation, which will involve your questions and response, and it's going to be great. Um, the br we provide brunch at 10 o'clock. I mean, a real brunch, right, Sophia? It's like yummy brunch. There's bagels and, and fruit and coffee and tea um, at 10. And then at 10.30 sharp, we will be having this conversation. So we, there are a few seats left. If you want to reserve a seat, you can talk to Sophia or to me or Simone or even to Wayne. Um, but also, if you come tomorrow, there's a few seats left. Just come and be part of the conversation. We're live streaming right tomorrow. And we are live streaming. Yeah, if you can't make it, it's always good to be on the live stream, too. Um, can I ask the question now? And answer it. I, oh, really? Yeah, why not? OK. Why do we have a course associated with this program? <laughs> That's a question. Um, we at Kelly Writers House, um, Kelly Writers House Fellows has been going for 23 years. This is my first time being associated with the course. Al's been teaching it for 23 years. Three amazing writers come every year. Um, this is a wonderful component of the program, getting to come to these public readings. These public readings are wonderful. But actually, students getting to spend an entire month reading intensively, discussing the work of each fellow is the sort of impetus for the course. It is the reason that we all get to come together this way for the public event, and that's why this is a joint program situation. And Simone, why are we in such a small, intimate space? It's like the four <laughs> questions. <laughs> Because Writer's House is the best place in the world, because it really is the best place in the world, and because what better place uh, than to sort of have this conversation, have, this is the place where it all happens. This is where we do the pedagogical part, this is where we do the public part, this is the only house on campus open to everyone, that you don't need a, you know, slide card to get in the spot. Um, this is where we belong, and so Kelly Writer's House is where we do our thing, always. Thank you, that was lovely. Okay, we wanna thank a couple people and then we're gonna turn it over to Sophia DeRose. Speaking of Sophia DeRose, we wanna thank Sophia, I hope you'll raise your hand. Sophia is completing, happily raising her hand, 
completing her first year as the coordinator of Writers House Fellows. We should have yes. put our hands together for the amazing amount of work that she does. Um, thank you, Sophia. Fabulous year of fellows. It ain't over till it's over, but we're, we're, getting, we're getting close. Lainey Brown, who is here, who co-convenes the course with us right there. Um, and the students who are in the fellow seminar, most of whom are here tonight, please raise your hands. They are, they're shy. They're super shy. Uh, they, they have spent a month reading Wayne's work and three months reading the work of the three fellows, and we're so grateful for them. They're amazing. Also want to thank Jessica Lowenthal, the director of the Writer's House, Ali Katz, who I don't know if it's Ali's out there, who's our program coordinator, and the other staff of the Writer's House who make this event possible. So now we're going to turn it over to Sophia DeRose, who's got a little gift for Wayne, and we'll introduce Zelda, who is then going to introduce Wayne. And is there too much formality here? Nah. Okay, hey, y'all. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. I'm happy to see so many people here. Um, I wanted to say quickly, this is the fourth fellows that I've been involved in in some way or another. Um, first year is coordinating it. But I am so happy that uh, you came, and I was so thrilled to get to meet you and speak with you today. Um, I think the work is, it speaks for itself, but it's amazing. Um, and so because we think it's so special that our fellows come all this way to be with us, we like to give you something special in return. So we have, we made a broadside for you in collaboration with the Common Press. Um, it says, where did you get the idea that anyone's relation to literature could come without fleshy exactions from your essay, Corpse Pose? So this is the first print of it, and you have a few more here. If any of y'all would like one, there'll be some available in the back where we're selling books after the end of the reading. Um, so here you go. Yeah, it's, this one is really cool. I've seen a lot of them. This one's really cool. So um, that's enough for me. I would like to welcome... Zelda Godsey Kellogg, who's going to do a formal introduction for Wayne. Well, I thought I wasn't going to be nervous, but now I am. Because um, you're actually here, um, and I wrote this about you. So, um, anyways, as a fellow manic list maker, I thought I would start tonight's event with a brief list. Paucity, floridities, nebulosities, asyntactic, supplicant, palpation, variegated, striations, transvaluation, quiddities, ovaltine, ablutions, lacrimose, coitus interruptus, j perle, Contrapuntal, bordello, approbation, bods, claviers, neurasthenic, decorousness, diminuendo, tremolo, filigree, desultory, adages, and grousing. So that was about a third of the words that I did not know while reading Wayne's Figure It Out. Um, there's like five more pages of that. Um, I looked up the meaning of each one, and I could tell you the definition, but I think we would be here all night. And I start with this list as a joke, but also as a launching point for understanding Wayne's work. When I first read Wayne's essay, My New Glasses, which he's wearing, he's wearing his new glasses, um, I was skeptical, to say the least. Perhaps I unwittingly share that anti-intellectual streak so ingrained in American letters, or perhaps I am simply throwing a tantrum at the gates of that stratum of society who so intimately knows the work of people like Maria Callas, know that there is one, more than one Aristotle in the annals of history. More likely, though, I am upset because I want to write with the scope and breadth of knowledge that Wayne brings to the page. Wayne is a queer theorist, poet, artist, filmmaker, critic, and novelist. In other words, a Renaissance man. 
His body of work is simply breathtaking, both in magnitude and complexity. Over the course of the past month, as we in the Writers' House Fellows Seminar read and discussed Wayne's work to prepare for his visit, I came to appreciate many things I thought I did not, nor ever would, enjoy, including opera, piano, Andy Warhol, and Picasso's chest. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it wouldn't really matter if, in the end, I enjoyed these things or not. Because Wayne writes in such a way as to make everyone care about what he's talking about. His work is both chatty and deeply sophisticated, quotidian and cosmic. He can make, quote, a subway passenger's leather bracelet prompt musings on the German word for stranger. That's another word in here, fremde. But in a way, talking about Wayne in this way is counterproductive. He has so much more to say than language has to offer. And our vocabularies are fickle things, unreliable, expressing the opposite of what we mean sometimes, or altogether failing us. We dwell in ineffable moments all the time. It is precisely these moments Wayne cherishes. His precise, picked verbiage probes the things we don't understand about ourselves. The origins of our desires, how we submit to and dominate others, how ardor presents itself in the body. Thus, it is impossible to read Wayne's work and not feel some sort of fleshy exaction. If pleasure is hosted within the body, so is disgust, revulsion. I wrote in one of my response papers for the Fellows Seminar that Wayne fractures reality and makes something new out of the shards of it and that he tirelessly refutes the logic of comprehension, opting in favor of the mess, the unfinished. But what does that look like exactly? It looks like a thorough, ex a thorough examination of a, doc of a diva's open throat, coupled with a meditation on how opening oneself to sound to the commanding presence of a quintessentially homosexual art form, opera, is a, is a form of freedom for queens as well as a form of subjugation. Wayne is a master, weaving together a delicate tape tapestry of amusing anecdotes, heavy critical analysis, and heartbreaking sincerity. And while digging through his archive at Yale University's Beinecke Library, I was lucky enough to come by many of his early writings on James Schuyler, not to mention a division set of problems from the fourth grade in a journal in which he describes a dream about a classmate of his, a boy, winning prettiest student in the school. And getting inside the mind of another writer, especially one as prolific and profound as Wayne, was just an absolute treat. He too has to start somewhere. He too hates words sometimes, a lot of the time, because they simply refuse to do as we wish. They outmaneuver us, elude us, but according to Wayne, this is their very utility. We should never be deterred from trying to sew them back together. And so it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to our final Kelly Writers House Fellow for 2023, Wayne Kestenbaum. beautifully written and beautifully delivered in a manner I would say almost presidential. <laughs> really good. What a lesson in public speaking, too. Seriously, very impressed with all of it. And you had a line about ardor. There was something about ardor's presence in the body. I really liked that. Um, I brought a potpourri of work and I'm, thank God there's a big clock there and it says quarter till seven. And I'm going to pay attention to that. So forgive me for dipping in and out of various works published and unpublished. It's a joy for me to be here and feel embraced by young writers who have been for a month immersed in me. And it's a, particularly this afternoon, it was a joy to hear from the students like Zelda, who had visited my archive 
maybe among the first people to visit it and had looked at process diaries I had kept in the 90s for writings of mine and could recite back to me things I had said or written in 1991, such as, I hate, 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 hate the sound of academic writing. Please let me sound like a real person and things like that. Very strange. And also I said at some point, I hate Andy Warhol. (laughs) There's a lot of hate. Okay, I have several new manuscripts not yet published, and some of them not even claimed. So I'm going to start with, I have a manuscript of playlets. The the book is called Dream Pumps. I've been writing little plays, sometimes as essays. If somebody asks for an essay, I will say, I don't think I can write an essay, but I can write a play. And half the time they say, okay, we'll take the play. And so I get to squeeze in these opportunities for play discourse. So I'm trying to I spent so much time with a hole puncher yesterday in New York doing this in these in these loose leaf notebooks and I'm really actually quite proud of my hole punching abilities. And I talked at length about this in the seminar today about what it taught me to reacquaint myself with the hole puncher. So but forgive the awkwardness of this. I'm going to read a little playlet. I wrote it for a a little movie I made that's available on my Instagram. It's for two people. The play is called Elevator Therapy. It takes place inside an elevator, and there are two characters. One is named Lucky. He is a young man. The other is Dr. Badinage, who is his psychotherapist. Lucky will face this way. Dr. Badinage will face this way. This elevator appears to be stuck on the fifth floor. If the elevator needs to be stuck, the fifth floor is the ideal place. An elevator is a strange location for a therapy session. You chose to embark on a therapy that you knew would take place solely in elevators. Dr. Badinage, will you accompany me to the noodle shop on the ground floor if this elevator ever decides to descend? Your inordinate love of noodles is a traumatic symptom. Is the symptom connected to my father finding his aunt's dead body and not telling us that she'd committed suicide? I'll try to admire the noodles you plan to eat in my presence, but I can't fully participate in your fantasy of shared noodle love. My mother had a miscarriage before she got pregnant with me. Do you think a plate of shared noodles will palliate that wound? Dr. Badinage, I feel an irresistible desire to take off my shirt. Not in an elevator. Save the striptease for the noodle shop on the ground floor. I guess that means I'm cured. I feel that you countenance my wish to take off my shirt in public and to eat noodles with you. True, noodles and nudity. When these two realms meet, the psyche is finally at peace with its fatal schisms. Look, Dr. Badinage, the elevator doors are opening. Don't exit. We haven't reached the ground floor. We're in the gap between floors, and if you step out of the elevator, you will fall into the void. Dr. Badinage, tell me about your homosexuality and its quirks. Tell me about your wardrobe, your kinks, your solitude. Everyone in the theater community knows your kinks, and yet you never reveal them to me. Let's change the subject and return to the scene of your father discovering his aunt's dead body. I want to hug and protect your kinks, as if they were pet raccoons I could later send to the pest control facility after showering them with my false affection and pseudo-forgiveness. Pity the pet raccoons, pity my kinks, pity your father and his dead aunt, pity your mother's miscarriage, pity this stuck elevator. Pity my future, stained already by the memory of this elevator ride to nowhere. I must be honest with you, my young friend. The noodle shop went out of business long ago. No more noodles? No more nudity? Is that what Miguel de de Unamuno meant when he coined the phrase, the tragic sense of life? 
We're nearly out of time. Here's a prescription for a new multi-purpose drug that will move through your system in a slithering oleaginous fashion, like noodles in a shallow bowl. Thank God this new drug, if it takes effect quickly, will give me the strength to complete my essay about Mary Cassatt. Next session, I'll tell you about my experiences in the war when I was briefly a prisoner, and we'll connect that experience to your fear of elevators. The elevator's moving again, and I have good news for you. A noodle shop is opening tonight in this building's penthouse. Even in a benighted, befouled era, regeneration is possible. I suddenly envision the last sentence of my Mary Cassatt essay. It will contain the words mother and child and the word death, and you will not have the power to correct or edit it because you too, your kinks, your velvet, will be included in that sentence as a lurid, dependent clause forgiven by the premature arrival of sunset. So that's a play. <clears throat> and another, another new manuscript, which is actually going to come out next uh, March from Semiotext, is a book of sonnets called Stubble Archipelago. They're bloated, engorged sonnets, because though they are 14 lines, each line spawns other little lines in a kind of bob and wheel fashion. So the, the line, or like a, you know, a long Walt Whitman line, the line doesn't just occupy the space it should, but it usurps the margin. The, the language is very clotted and compressed unto disorientation, but put on your life vest, please. This is the second sonnet in the book. It's called I Doctor Wanted. I doctor wanted at last my cock combined with forehand Mozart sonatas. His tall wife, his tall Norwegian wife, Kaftan in bed with us for novelistic complexity. Chocolate chips, raisins, cashews in dish daughtered up my three o'clock disappearance. Time to teach math, ninth graders, my outlaw bike ride hill, a milkshake homo reverie, forehead coin angle, C-O-I-G-N, forehead coin angle legatoing me into world peace treaty dissolver or solver. Magnet dream told in St. Louis undoes how hinge folds kill you, minus Samothrace appendage. Weathercock gaming his ass, I said, you're gorgeous to no inkling avail. Like kindling, tossing homo down grim hills, latalania ant lip fissure. That's grim, G R I M M, and it's A U N T. Like kindling, tossing homo down grim hills, latalania ant lip fissure. Treacle, damage me. Then reverse the scar. Drop basted turkey on Kissinger foot. No peace in, did they fuck speculation? Cramming his memento mori pubes backward to canker Eden. Grail comes back. Scar, no impediment. Gummed, shame salami, mispronounced. Samizdat, lice poem. Tinkle the fairy arc rope, a -R -K. Tinkle the fairy arc rope, wizarding stained cruelty daughter, now regal aged Cassandra. Cram him up, celebrate him crammed, revise the cramming, call the cram cream. How redux can you make East Germany, ducky? I get plumbed by
by Rose Thorne, a Jekyll teething ring. Sorry to interrupt it with the spelling lessons, but it's just like if I'm saying arc, if I'm saying arc rope and you think it's A-R-C, that's legal, but it's not arc, it's A-R-K, which is different. It's kind of biblical. And I'm a biblical guy at base. Bibl- yeah, you know, it's fun. Writers have, I think, cards up their sleeves. And like, the Ark is one of my cards. <laughs> We're going to get a little more thesis statement-ish. I have often said, I was reminded of that in the conversation today in the seminar about my avowed avoidance of thesis statements, argument, plot, things like that. I do have strong opinions about what I love and value. And I had a chance writing a forward to this book of mine that came out in 2018, I think. It's called Notes on Glaze, G-L-A-Z-E, Notes on Glaze, 18 Photographic Investigations. It's a series of 18 short essays which read vernacular found photographs. And in the introduction, I state my philosophy of reading, in a sense. So I like these paragraphs, and I want to read them to you as a way of summarizing why I do on paper the weird things I do. And why I form a weird life that will give me the material to write those weird things on paper. The narrator of these episodes is sometimes me and sometimes not me. Occasionally I speak in my legitimate voice, but more often I speak illegitimately. My words thrown outward and elsewhere into somebody else's body. Hollywood crops up frequently like the hives. These tales, rarely practical, don't give advice. They stringently pursue momentary fantasies in an attempt to back away from and thus to tackle a predicament that freezes speech. In these fuitons, I stayed loyal to the sentence as a zone of emergency condensation, playful code, constrained theater. I wanted to undo the identity of a paragraph. A paragraph is just a box of sentences, much as a stanza is just a box of lines. And as a sentence is just a box of words, and as a sentence is just a box of words, phrases, and syntactical positions. Maybe, if we're lucky, a subordinate clause can offer surgical replenishment, as when geckos dispense with an appendage and then grow a new one. To the plights or doldrums depicted in these photos, I contribute an inquisitive overlayer of glaze. I seem to ally glaze with the emptiness of enigma and the fullness of aura. I depict glaze as the realm of throttled ineffability, that which can't speak, but also with a fantasy life given free reign to meander and to amplify its own overtones. Glaze is the only gift I can offer, even if glaze isn't what the aching world needs now. Glaze, which contains glade, gaze, G-A-Y-S, gaze, Z-E, haze, and glows, is certainly a form of mist or mystification. Haven't I always sided with perfume, with mere atmosphere? The etudes here don't announce a theory, though sometimes they try to. I aimed to describe contrasting sensations of imaginative abundance and of bleak frozenness. I wanted the pleasure and discipline of trying to pack too much material into a very tight container. I wanted to overflow the seams, to enter the pressure chamber of aphorism, and to dally with an uncomfortable eroticism, a sexuality, melancholy, loquacious, brash, whose flashy curtain razors intersect with risk and regret. A farcical approach to arousal doesn't preclude ambrosial regression, 
time suspension and mystical dilation. Everywhere in my writing, desire interrupts the banquet, like a rude guest or a gregarious tumbler trying to rev the audience. I cook up cheap thrills so I can feel alive enough to analyze. Sequential language, its wheels, its protocols, puts me in the position of witnessing the fires of elation through a glazed pane. A screen that turns the excitement into a festival of embers, even though the embers try to dress themselves up as full-fledged flames. The word glaze doesn't appear frequently in this collection, but the concept leaks into every corner. Glaze refers to the patina of the photographs themselves, to the gazes of the captured subjects, and to the roundaboutness of my procedure. Glaze is a style of consciousness, a style not necessarily chosen, that can be summoned for use as elucidator and as protector. Glaze is not a style that one takes up as a happy calling. Glaze is nothing to brag about. Glaze, however, is a way of relishing unpleasure. When I wander from the point, those are the moments when I am being most obedient to the call of glaze. A long time ago, <clears throat> I wanted to write a book about shininess, which I never did, but this is, this is that book. That chair is publication, actually, that ch where I'm bringing the things one by one. It's just out of my life, <laughs> out of my life. <clears throat> I'm going to read now from a manuscript that is really truly in process of, new of poems in a new mode I'm experimenting with, which is a little more narrative, surreal, no punctuation, double spaces between each line, f somewhat free-floating syntax, but little, little allegories. I'm just going to read a few of these. The first is called The New King Lear. King Lear has three daughters, precarity, care, and affordances. Precarity works at a pharmacy. Care manages a bank. Affordances is a barkeep. Affordances is the brightest of the lot rambui for the masses. Lear is not the center of this story. Affordances and care get along smashingly. Precarity sticks to herself. Precarity has three daughters. She is the duplication principle. She duplicates the prodigality of her father, among other burdens not to be mentioned. The elasticity of the fable diminished after too many revolutions. I have been patiently listening to this tale, waiting for its climax. I mentioned the virtue of the stretto many years ago, the moment in a fugue when it tumbles toward conclusion. Lear has no wife. Precarity, care, and affordances have no mother. We need to crack down on impostors. Too many people are posing as mothers and fathers. Another glass of drambuie, please. Thank you, Lear, for messing up my life. I keep forgetting to bring the staple gun home from the studio to fix the carpet no longer securely attached to the staircase. Each of us has a new orifice today. Inside the regular orifice, you can find an anterior orifice. I am here to help you narrate the saga of the new orifice. Another little poem, The Confessions of Wendy Boy. To become the fable by inverting it into a rhododendron. To split the rhododendron's difference into a quibble and a parterre. To make a parterre the site of a lesbian affair. A plié lesbian parterre, for example. When I was Wendy Boy, a friend to philodendrons and pansies, I wasn't I. I was a plié. Or was I the papillon, haranguing the philodendrons stacked against the wall? I am the wall. 
heretofore known as Wendy Boy, a plie boy without a necessary tincture of taciturnity. This is called the new nudity. He sits on what used to be my talent. Up close, his overly shaped pubic hair. A vista larger and more uncontaminated than I'd expected. Trying to get fixings in the mess hall. Brisket, unwelcome. Edge voice, repete. To re-peter him. Make him a doubled peter. More developed, muscled, though shaved. The mother understood the doubled son's predicament. He was no longer permitted clothing. His new nudity abolished a former precocity. As a kitchen spawns a kitchenette, a luncheon, a luncheonette. His ass squishes my former talent. In the middle of the mess hall, you can glance at the linden tree. It's blooming already mentioned when the wound's last droplets fell on the mench. And in 2021, in the midst of the pandemic, I published a book of short fiction, fables, called The Cheerful Scapegoat, with semiotext. And some of these were written as art essays for artists, some not. <laughs> and because I do take occasions, commissions, as a chance to find the thing I want to say and to try to use that occasion as the public chance to perform that excavation. This is the title story, The Cheerful Scapegoat. I won't read the whole thing. I just want to read the last two pages, which means more to me than many things I've written. I don't know why they mean more to me, but they seem like a concentrated, somewhat surreal, but a concentrated enactment of a position dear and dire, dear to me and dire for me, that resembles the position of bleak frozenness and aura-filled patina that I sketched in Notes on Glaze. The the character, title character, not title, the heroine is Crocus. As her name is Crocus. And she's at a party and there's a harpsichordist at the party and she's about to become kind of a sacrifice. I'll stop when there's little things I need to explain. Just two, it's actually two and a half pages. <clears throat> okay. Instantly, Crocus gave up her plans to walk down the promenade des Anglais. She gave up her plans to take movement classes at the hotel. She would find a movement class here in town. She would begin movement classes the next day if she survived the party, if the still unscripted events destined to take place that night around the harpsichord left her sufficiently unscarred. What kind of movements am I attempting to learn, thought Crocus, the answer didn't matter. Most important was to plan to learn how to move in a new way, even if these newly baptized methods had no basis in medical or spiritual fact. I will begin my movement classes tomorrow morning, Crocus murmured later that evening as she stood beside the harpsichord, the circle of partygoers surrounding the instrument and the sacrifice. I will learn how to move like a swan or like a tugboat or like an iguana. Tadeo and Jesse, they kind of run the joint, smiled at Crocus, who was a good learner. Rameau's ornamentation posed difficulties for the harpsichordist, a local hack, who lacked knowledge of period styles. The harpsichordist's mordants were clumsy, and Crocus felt stung by their maladroitness. The harpsichordist, who could no doubt sense Crocus's dismay, placed that dismay on a distant shelf in a clavier consciousness whose only duty tonight lay in the parsimoniously shaped phrase, the intrusively plangent appoggiatura, the strategically irregular trill. 
to leave Crocus now in her circle of flagellants at the mercy of a crude harpsichordist and a thrill-hungry group of behavior experimentalist ex- behavior experimentalists shows no cruelty on our part. Our sympathies lie with Crocus. We admire her cheerfulness. She brings mirth and contrast to the monochromatic, humorless rooms through which she passes on her slow journey toward tomorrow's movement classes, taught by incompetent masters with no grasp of kinetic fundamentals and no tenderness for the bodies whose flesh is subject to the palpations and distensions of movement sages without scruple. We admire the movement teachers, despite their unethical haggardness. Tomorrow I will find a new way to move, Crocus continued to murmur. The harpsichordist ignored her senseless mutterings. A good instrumentalist must pay strict attention to the tempo. Without a steady yet flexible pulse, the piece approaches ruin. Ruin might be a good goal, however, if Crocus's sufferings are to be our guide. Crocus's consciousness burned down to the slimmest filament of plausibility, and yet its flame continued to attract flagellants and admirers. Around Crocus, the admirers stayed fast within their circle formation. The admirer flagellants held hands to keep the circle serene and firm. Crocus began to dance, if you call those stumbling steps a dance. The movement class was already in process, and it had no teacher. I am already where tomorrow told me I must wait for it to arrive, Crocus said in a loud, clear voice. Her dance collapse, a cross between resurrection and ruin, attained a new fixity and vividness. This dance is where we must now live, she continued in her bright, confident tone. She staggered and regained balance and staggered again. The circle of flagellant admirers clapped their hands rhythmically with a ferocity veined by igneous strands of kindness. To call our behavior kind, to call this congregation civilized, requires an imagination addicted to the fumes that rise from notoriety. Who is notorious tonight? Crocus is newly notorious and will remain so as long as she continues to carve out through non-movement a movement class without master. Now we must face this sordid investigation by rubbing a turpentine-soaked rag over the figure's already smeared features. So as I read that again and think about why I wrote it, you know, I'm not... My first nature is not a fiction writer, though that's what, for the early years of my writing life, I did. But... I do find uniquely mesmerizing for me as writer to enter a, an allegorical plot that I momentarily believe in, enough to stage there a drama that I need to see staged. Then I depart. And it's, I think, it, you could, it's a certain hyper intensity of focus and attention combined with uh, rapid onset of disenchantment that characterizes my ardors and my style, I think. But I am grateful for the intensity of fixity of consciousness when it comes. I'm going to read now couple of paragraphs from an essay I wrote in this book, My 1980s and Other Essays, published in 2013. This is an essay about a young photographer I deeply admire, Paul Mpagi Sepuya, born in 1982. And I wrote this essay for one of his first catalogs. 
about a very early body of his work of portraits. And I just want to read two paragraphs, maybe three, maybe four. So the essay is called Eric Stubble. <clears throat> Eric is my first love. My second love, nearly eclipsing the first, is Victor. Victor has wild hair teased into a black halo. The circle of hair, outrageously large, contrasts with his bookish or revolutionary eyeglasses, which recall the nerd glasses I wore in 1972. His glasses seem sweetly nebbishy, serious, unap unapologetic, and headed toward radical liberation. In a 2010 portrait taken in Sapuya's bedroom, Victor kneels, feet underneath buttocks in SM stirrups, ready for action. Glasses still on, he stares at the camera with confident yet prim expressionlessness. Victor has ostentatious stubble. To say I feel sexual desire for Victor would be a gross understatement. Wishing to forswear the phrase sexual desire because of its incompleteness, its haziness, and its talent for question begging, I'll say instead that Victor provokes in me a hunger for narrative. What consumes me with curiosity is Victor's sly contraposto, as if he were deliberately quoting a Renaissance or Greco-Roman precedent. His hand pivoting at the wrist establishes ironic feyness as a signature of power and self-control. Opened on the folding chair is a zine, red-covered, called Fire. I won't make the mistake of, assu of asserting that my desire for Victor is this photograph's exclusive meaning. And I won't oversimplify desire. What I'm calling desire for Victor is a tangle of contradictory convictions. One, I look like Victor. Two, I don't look like Victor. Three, I used to look like Victor. Four, no one recognized that I used to look like Victor. Five, it's too late to find Victor. Six, I need to change my life so that I can find Victor or make a career out of pursuing him. Seven, I need to become a more serious artist so that I can use my desire for Victor in productive ways. Eight, I need to compose a blazon for Victor. Nine, I need to read more philosophy so I can grasp Victor's profundity. Okay. Um, I want to read... Yeah, I just want to read one more bit from figure, excuse me, from my 1980s. Another, like the thing I read from Notes on Glaze, a couple of paragraphs that seem to me a kind of position statement about why I love what gets called abstract art. It's an essay about if I, Forrest Bess, who is a kind of outsider artist of great renown and whose paintings are miraculously beautiful, somewhere between Tantra paintings and folk landscapes, but their abstraction is the thing that grabs me. And I'm just going to read a, a two paragraphs. Okay. I'm talking about here first a painting where there are blue and black blobs that are just like kind of chunks of paint. To pay attention to these blue and black blobs, or to pay attention to the blue foil triangle's nearness to a specific dot, I must pledge allegiance to Abstract Art's Bill of Rights, which contains, unlike the United States', only one provision. The right to look for unstructured amounts of time at migrant and unspecific forms, and at the relation between them, without demanding that the forms have a single meaning and without demanding that whatever significance I ascribe to these forms be defensible, explicable, or based on any evidence but my own sensations. This right is not the same as radical indeterminacy. Bess's paintings promulgate the liberty to find determinate but not explicable or defensible meanings in the appearance of perhaps random and unintended shapes and in their intercourse or non-adjacency. 
I have the right to find supreme significance in Bess's blobs and lines and to spend as long as I wish in a state of torpid yet ecstatic surrender to them. I'm defending the right to succumb to trance, but the state I'm praising is more precise than trance and contains more agency. I'm also defending the right to be solitary, unpopular, and unbeheld. Bess needed solitude to make his art. Art justified his solitude, gave it dignity or purpose. Maybe half the reason someone becomes an artist, or the kind of artist that Bess became, is to experience uninterrupted solitude. The supreme craving may be for solitude, not for art. Here is how the great poet Fernando Pessoa put it in the Book of Disquiet. Art is an isolation. Every artist should seek to isolate others, to fill their souls with a desire to be alone. I'm going to skip and read two more paragraphs. To phrase it more emphatically, areas of monochrome in Bess's paintings tend to become enlivened by palette knife marks, as if the monochrome portion were a too calm sea that required turbulence to justify its existence. The monochrome portion, though static, steady, unwavering, paradoxically calls forth an excess of effort from Bess's hand, and we hyper-respond to Bess's effort, not because we feel sorry for him or wish to turn him into a hero, but because the juxtaposition of effort and unvarying monochrome creates in our body, or my body at least, a turn-of-the-screw effect, a tightening or opening, as if the experience of seeing Bess's palette knife marks were drawing out from me a conviction that life can be more interesting and complicated, more of an emergency, than I dreamed possible. And paradoxically, it is precisely the uninteresting aspects of life, the monochromes, that Bess redeems with his palette knife effortfulness. By turning ordinariness or drabness into intensity, albeit a quiet intensity, undemonstrative, off-the-grid, non-urban, best converts somnolence into carnival. Looking at an untitled painting of a red sky surmounting two... Let me see if I want to read this paragraph. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Looking at an untitled paragraph of a red sky surmounting two breast-shaped hills, the sun a weak globe nearly occupying the cleavage between the hills, I notice scratch marks. I want to start a religion based on scratches or based upon the experience of scrutinizing scratches. What would I be worshipping? Randomness? The scratch marks obey no pattern. Aggression? The scratch marks seem to stem from Bess's low-level rage at himself, at the world, at the sky, at God. Invasion? Like an Old Testament wanderer, I'll deify any voice that hits on me, any voice in the desert that rains its tablets down on me. I'll deify anything that scratches or invades me, thrusts its facture upon me. Like Antonin Artaud, Bess seems to have taken the experience of being violated, however metaphorically, as an incursion of Godhead. To be raped within the Bess Artaud cosmology is to receive divine visitations. And yet, in Bess's case, these incursions were marks he made himself, probably with a palette knife. And I wanted to read that in part because I talked today in the seminar about my one month old love affair with uh, cameraless filmmaking, which involves using clear 16 millimeter leader or bleaching found footage and then drawing on it, painting on it, uh, doing various, you know, pasting debris on it, uh, punching out holes from other film stock and pasting those, taping those holes down on it, but particularly scratching. Uh, I, I, some of you may have seen Jatovia Gary's work, the ecstatic experience, at the Whitney or at Paula Cooper Gallery or somewhere. And what was so particularly moving about that film was the presence of scratches 
that the artist had put around the suffering or demonstrative or proud figures from the historical footage that she was doing. And Chotovia Gary took a work, this very workshop that I took in Brooklyn. So I think it's, let's just say that the two of us and others are reviving a, a kind of film practice, moving image artist practice from the 60s and 70s. And so revisiting this essay today about Forrest Bess's scratches made me think again about the self-sufficiency of scratching as a satisfying aesthetic procedure. And maybe it's, you know, we all know about brush strokes and things like that, but do we know enough about scratches? And maybe the gentleness of a scratch. It's like, you know, if I were Tennessee Williams, I'd say it's a kitten clawing at the door of God, you know? (laughs) Sometimes at night I feel like a kitten clawing at the door of God. (laughs) Isn't that right? I'm going to read one more thing. I'm going to read a couple of passages from my newest book, Ultramarine, which completes a a, a trilogy I call a trance trilogy of uh, pink marm, the pink trance notebooks, camp marmalade, and ultramarine. I'm just going to read a few little passages that. What I've been trying in this book to do is reclaim mellow poeia. Pound Ezra long ago said there's mellow poeia and logo poeia. He said there's a different poeia, but I forget what it is. And once a poet said, you're logo poeia, and I'm mellow poeia, which is like saying, you know, you write nonfiction, I'm a poet. I said, wait, I want to be mellow poeia too. And this book is my attempt to be mellow poeia, and I'll give you the first sampling of it. Nobody knows, I think, who June Havoc is, but I'm going to say June Havoc was Gypsy Rose Lee, the stripper's sister. Maybe some of you know who Hector Berlioz was, a a romantic composer, symphony fantastique, herald in Italy. And so in class today, the conversation led us to, Wayne, do you, for your cultural references, where do you look for them? And I said, I don't look for them. They come to me. They arrive like lightning bolts, and I take what I'm given, and I relish it. And so what comes to me is June Havoc and Berlioz, and here they dance together as words. Okay. June Havoc, Berlioz. June Havoc demarcates. June Havoc demarcates Berlioz. June Havoc is demarcated by Berlioz. Or a plus-size Berlioz is ultra-demarcated by a bunch of June Havocs. A cold June Havoc warming up a fell Berlioz. A fallen Berlioz in love backwards chronologically with a plush June Havoc. Learning to long for her own ruined habitat in Berlioz's eyes. Heavy, humid Egon Sheila in mist. She rinses Sheila shortly. June Havoc grammatically rinses Sheila shortly. The gay department of Thursday's Sheila speaking Italian. No, the gay department of Thursday's Sheila speaking Italian to work related June Havoc. But specify why June Havoc. Suddenly, who is June Havoc from the narrator's point of view coming to ease the blue stain? He's chill with June Havoc, alive in a role misbegotten on hold. June Havoc, whole and flowery, a high or hiked June, like June took a long hike up Yosemite's tallest peak to try coming alone up there novelistically as what Berlioz took for granted. And here... Oh, it's somewhere. Maybe it doesn't even... You know, I think I'm not finding it, so I'm going to find instead. I think I have to give you my Liza Minnelli dreams. I hadn't meant to. I was going to end on a, on a higher note. She's pretty high. <laughs> I'm serious. She is. Okay. Dreamt intimacy with Liza Minnelli, accidentally nude in a one-woman show, flashing her crotch's semi-phallic clump. She came into audience, sat beside me, wanted flesh contact, faulted me for not following through on the embrace, sent me to Judy's room. And then, it's another Liza dream. (laughs) 
well, you know, this, I'm just, I'm going to, the problem with this book or its virtue maybe is that it doesn't stick with the one thing. So now I, I'm going to move to the next bit, which is uh, Walter Benjamin refers to Cole Porter's in his 1930 radio broadcast aimed at Berlin children. I like Benjamin best when he is speaking to children about Cole Porter's and puppet shows. He mentions Unter den Linden. To that spot of time I may return, seeking vainly to translate the Linden's askew testimony. But don't scorn me if sloth, fear, or faithlessness prevent my return. And then to end, I'm going to end with this, which is a passage where I talk about the meaning of ultramarine. So it is like, it's the thesis statement of the book if a poem needs to have a thesis statement. I mean, the thesis statement of the cantos is, I cannot make it cohere. And isn't that, shouldn't that be the thesis statement of every poem? Or certainly every long poem. The unseen afterlife is promiscuous, or the fringes of consciousness are promiscuous. Tomorrow, say more about why the unseen is promiscuous. Some mystic in a New Haven backyard spotted the god personage, suddenly materialized, a ficus beneath a sky too late to qualify as ultramarine. Why characterize sight as aggressive and curious? Why not imagine sight as passive, expectant, accepting whatever bounty is thrown to its cur soul? Notice now I'm calling our plight a Curs, cur incurious, because to seem too curious would offend the sky. We hope will return to the ultramarine that precedes absolute night. A thousand stars puncture your misgivings, pierce your distrustful sight sickness, and provide pinched apertures for wording everything differently the next time we make this voyage. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Wayne. Are you, are you up for a couple of minutes of Absolutely. questions or comments or just praise? Just praise statements. would be good. We have no, a few I think minutes probably, of that. It, if, if we have 10 minutes of this, it will be a full hour. Perfect. Yeah, but yes. we don't have to have a 10 minutes. Questions, minute. praise, comments about what you heard. It's always hard to start. And a reminder that tomorrow we're back at 10 o'clock for brunch and 10.30 for, you know, a whole bunch of questions and comments. Who's going to be first? Here we go. Thank you. Yeah, when you read from the uh, introduction of the glaze mm -hmm. thing, you mentioned not only it being a sort of thesis statement about the way that you were reading, but a thesis statement about you designing a weird life that would allow you to read in that way. Could you elaborate on that some more? I, yeah, I think I said, I believe I said that about the essay Eric Stubble, about dreaming up the weird... Life. So do you want me to answer the question about notes on glaze or about Eric Stubble, or does it not matter? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I guess... Okay, let's just say that you want to be a writer and you're 18. And let's say you know you want to be a writer because you've had, while writing, several very intense experiences experiences where your emotions and your thoughts seem both to calm down and to intensify in a way that feels like truth. And so the, let's say with no or very little outside evidence that you decide that you want to become a writer in pursuit of those moments of intense apprehension, in a good way, apprehension or insight. And let's say that as you start learning how to write and writing, what you produce on the page remains very far away from those occluded instants 
of darkness and light where you saw things that you wanted to write about and so that you try to form a life that will make you more able to bring your writing closer to those experiences but to not forget that your primary allegiance is to those experiences that made you want to be a writer some of them very painful experiences or ones of deep annihilating conflict which may often have led to silence so that you need to remain very close to your most painful and weird and silence producing experiences so that you can remain interested enough in reading and writing to get to a point where you can maybe put on the page some of the things that led you to have those experiences but meanwhile your hunger for those experiences starts to creep into other aspects of aesthetic existence where you can have those experiences and it's not as if you know what those experiences are but your fealty remains to those experiences and so the weird life that you end up having aside from all the issues of making a living and figuring out social relations and interpersonal relations and health and politics aside you know all that mess you um you kind of end up mixing your own weird cocktail of life and art where you can maximize your contact with the fructifying experiences even and you get them half the time as i did with forrest bess in these kind of vindicating moments where you see in another artist or writer that this thing is possible and maybe you see it in instances where the artist's or writer's life seems on the surface blighted like Forrest Bess or unfortunate and when you see the intensity of these experiences represented or reenacted in lives that seem not exemplary or role model kind of lives you get more excited and you start looking around in weirder and weirder places and so Victor and Eric Stubble comes into that because I wander into an art gallery and there are these amazing photographs of these young men and it's all these with their weird cream gray faces and these weird like ivory taupe just like the, the strange pale varieties of pallor and these and you start to and you think huh that's this guy's Victor I kind of want to know Victor, but do I just want to write? A, you, know, you start to get, con you st and then you know what? Victor, I was at a, if you remember, Victor was the guy with the stubble in the thing. I went to the the abstract painter, Louise Fishman, who has a studio, and she's dead now, unfortunately, but she had a studio in the building where I have a studio. She had some people to her studio to sh look at paintings, and you know who was bartending? Victor. And Vic, yeah. So what I mean, that just mean you could say, "Oh, you little coterie baby, with your new with your New York centrality." It's not really that. It isn't that. It's it's huh. So why does and why did it end up that Louise Fishman and I had the same piano teacher? What was Louise Fishman, an abstract painter, doing taking piano lessons? What was I doing taking piano lessons? The things add up. I think, and so you end up the pathways that you make through your life, the people you care about, the experiences you seek out, lead you to, and f you know, lead you to take very seriously the like Crocus with her movement classes. You know, her movement classes tomorrow are very important, and maybe the, my Crocus movement classes took place in the film, the sixteen millimeter film scratching seminar, and so that's the weirdness. Thanks for the forging question. that kind of destiny. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I think Davy here has a, a question. Why, yes, Al, I have a question. Uh, and that was a beautiful reading. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Thank Wayne. Uh, I so appreciated that answer because uh, it was largely about continuous relationships to attention, attention as a process that returns, that's recursive, that renews. And I want to ask you about something related and different in two parts. Part one is 
you've been paying attention to how attention works for you as a mode and how it works across media for you as a mode for decades. Mm -hmm. How does it shift is part one. How does your relationship to attention change as your brain changes? Part two is how does your relationship to attention change as New York changes? The New York of the 80s, unrecognizable in the present in lots of ways, recognizable in others. And I think of your work as having in many moments, the city quietly behind it, and in mm -hmm. some moments, the city more, more forcefully behind it. And I want, wanted to ask about that shift in attention in your own practice, and in your practice as it is quietly or sometimes more forcefully in dialogue with the city changing along with you. Hmm. Such a beautiful question. About attention, atten yeah, attention matters to me a lot, and I think it began, the quest for attention began for me in high school when I took playing classical piano very, very, very seriously. And I was so aware of my inability to pay continuous attention with a kind of, I had an amazing piano teacher in high school who totally changed my life because of the quality of her attention to what she heard and the, and the strictness with which she held me, kind strictness to hearing and executing what house a phrase could be and I, I considered those such rapturous experiences but I felt my own life to be so uh, you know what 15 year old life is capable of you know so I didn't know do I want to be a monk do I want to be, what do I want to do to have this to be paying continual attention at that highest level it doesn't work it even backfires as a pianist you can't pay for one thing you have to pay attention to movement and to flow and i'm like a film still one frame 24 frames per second i'm isolating the voices in one chord and trying to hear them separately that's that does not land physical movement to a phrase i'm freezing the phrase which freezes my body in a weird way. So I was always, as a pianist, caught between striving for a microscopic level of attention to detail with an increasing physical stiffness around playing the piano because I was dealing in this arrested, like a film still mode of listening. So I've loosened up. So moving to when I started writing, deciding I wanted to be a writer when I was 18, that was an incredible loosening up. Everybody speaks language. It wasn't this thing I had to pay continual. I could ride a bus and then write. It just, it didn't, you, uh, the porous is a word people like to use. I was more, the world and I were more porous with each other. I didn't need a soundproof room. And I didn't need to have this extra sensory set of antennae of listening. And then in terms of like New York and that part of the question, I'm certainly, it's, it's, it would be very banal for me to go on and on about like the digital and about like, iPhones and all that, but I am, you know, and there are a lot of books that many of them I've read about attention and the information glut of now. And I think a lot about my changing patterns of attention since I am an avid consumer of stuff online as anyone is. But in terms of New York, I just want to say, to go back to the Louise Fishman and Victor Jeffries, his name is Victor Jeffries. He's a wonderful performer and photographer photographer and to say to think about New York I was aware when I moved I lived in New York in the 80s I moved back in 1996 and I was aware when I moved back I moved back to 23rd Street very aware that I was living on the street where James Schuyler had lived and in my essay about James Schuyler I, th I think about what it means to be on 23rd Street where there's a plaque on Chelsea Hotel I was also aware that John Ashbery lived around the corner and that Susan Sontag and Debbie Harry both lived in my building. They were, in a way, figures from earlier generations, but they were part of my constellation. I didn't have contact with them. James Schuyler was dead. But I didn't have, it wasn't that I had contact with them, but I was mapping my 1997 New York on 1960, on, for, on earlier New Yorks, represented by the still living bodies who had formed those sorts of New York. And then I think the time passes, and, it, and then I became, started doing visual art in 2010, and which meant then starting my life 
all over again in New York and, you know, re-experiencing from the ground up visual, the media involved in visual art, which meant re-traversing 1940. You know, it meant in a way being Lee Krasner, a bad Lee Krasner, but like a, like starting from scratch in, in like the same thing with the 16 millimeter. Now it's like, oh, right. Where in 1950 would I have gone to get 16 millimeter developed? And so having separate awarenesses in, of the many New Yorks, and I'll just uh, we'll say one more thing. My phone tells me when I'm in my studio that I'm, it, it names an art gallery as the location. That art gallery closed 15 years ago, and the person who ran it is dead. My phone says, like the location thing, thinks I'm at that gallery, where, in fact, I had a book party in two th- the year 2000 for the book Cleavage. So the, the, the deep elevator shaft of these things, and that's just my life. I mean, we all, and then you could, you could do L.A., you could do anywhere. And to be aware of those is to be kind of like a walking docent. So I feel a little bit like I'm tiptoeing. Well, docents generally walk. But I guess, but I mean, like I'm a docent without people around me to explain the art. I'm walking. And I, th- I think, you know, I, I think about those things. That's in a way, it's nice about urban living because it's called, I guess, the palimpsest. Maybe one more question and then it's time. Uh, one more, yep. I have one. Okay. Zelda. It was a really great introduction. I whoa. I have two questions. One is a small one. Kind of a yes or no question. Okay. Um, it's like this is going. Okay. Um, One for the book about ultramarine. Um, I watched your sit down, I guess, Maggie Nelson, and I was just wondering, is it at all related to Bluettes? Like, does it have anything to do at all? It's interesting. So the yes, I would say consciously no. Because I wrote, my first book was going to be called Fugitive Blue. I wrote a poem and became Ode to Anamafo, but there's a poem in it called Fugitive Blue that is all about blue. And so I think, I, I don't, so I've been thinking about blue all my life. And I, I am now aware, I became aware after the book came out or even, you know, at various phases, I thought, and I remember when Maggie wrote that book. She was my student then, and I remember how much I loved it and how much I felt changed by it. But in different ways than are reflected in the use of blue. It was more, I think, in her book, an attitude, a free attitude toward raw experience, a certain grabbing of raw experience and making a, a usable snapshot of it. And then um, in the cheerful scapegoat, when you were talking about, I don't really know how to concisely put it, but like those moments when you feel like uh, uh, some sort of truth or some sort of like intenseness or something like that, um, and that's sort of like what you're writing for, and you mentioned in uh, two uh, pages, two and a half pages that you read in the cheerful scapegoat that it was like central to something mm-hmm. about you. Um, do you think that that was like those two and a half pages were a moment where you were like being able to reach back and touch that truth or was it like, I, like a thesis or are those different things? I guess it would be that I don't yet understand what crocus is frozen sacrificially in the midst of i do understand i don't so i I guess i think movement classes represent 
physical, sexual, and aesthetic movement and a kind of deep eschatological, not scatological, but maybe also thinking of all that business, the sense of, you know, maybe the movement of molecules. Crocus really is in quest of that movement, but there is, but, but is being at that moment sacrificed and the movement class has no master. I guess what I mean is I'm caught still within, caught in a state of not knowing by all the paradoxes that I've set up there and feel that I have, yeah, have yet to understand. I also have yet to understand why I couldn't stay in that moment and write say make it write a next chapter why did we have to leave why did i have to take a turpentine soaked rag and smear the figure to expunge that episode from the record wayne kestenbaum everyone thank you so much wayne um we're back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for brunch and 10.30. We have these broadsides that are free. Uh, you can grab one, and I'm sure Wayne would be willing to inscribe it. We also have some of Wayne's books in the back. So Wayne will be up here for a little while to inscribe your books and greet you. Thank you again for coming to the Kelly Writer's House. One more time, let's thank Wayne Kestenbaum. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, those are your